morning. I hope everyone had a good weekend. So um, this morning, uh, we're going to talk about ecologic studies. Uh, and ecologic studies are a type of study that are very, very common in epidemiology. They're a type of study that all of you have heard about. You may or may not have recognized them as ecologic studies. Um, and some people argue that ecologic studies generate hypotheses. And other people argue that ecologic studies are part of the hypothesis testing uh, armamentarium of studies that epidemiologists can do uh, to, to test hypotheses. Um, and so we won't resolve that this morning because, as I'll show you, there are differences of opinion about what you can and can't interpret from e ecologic observations. Uh, but uh, one way or another, they're very, very common and an important study design for you to be familiar with. Um, so uh, this is what I'm going to refer to as an ecologic observation, not an ecologic study, but an ecologic observation. And so this is taken, obviously, from a newspaper. And it points out, I don't know how many students we have here from Kern County, but it points out that Kern County here in California, uh, as it says here, by several measures, is one of the most polluted counties in the nation. Dense smog, agricultural waste, unknown doses of dangerous chemicals create an environment that ranks third worst among US metropolitan areas for ozone, particulate pollution, et cetera. Uh, and then um, also you'll see Kern County contains four of the 10 California zip codes with the highest rates of infant mortality between 1992 and 2001. And so obviously putting the, and here you can even see a UC Berkeley professor uh, who has uh, done something on looking at air pollution and infant mortality. So um, this is what I'll call an, an ecologic observation. So somebody notices that uh, things are bad, if you will, or that certain environmental conditions exist, uh, and at the same time that some health outcome seems to be uh, elevated in the same area. Um, and so then it makes you wonder, is there a cause-effect relationship? Okay. Uh, so I'll call that an ecologic observation, not a study. Here's another example. Uh, if, if you shop at the Berkeley Bowl and you read the magazines on the way out, as I do, you can peruse Mothering Magazine, which is one of my favorites. Uh, and here you can see uh, a quote from Mothering Magazine. The founder of the National Vaccine Information Center raises profound questions about the relationship between the increase in childhood vaccinations and the rise in chronic illnesses. Again, an ecologic observation. We seem to be giving more vaccines, we are giving more vaccines to children. Uh, diseases seem to be increasing in children. Is there some relationship between vaccination and chronic illness? And so here you can see some additional quotes from this article. Since the 1960s, the reported incidences, prevalences of autism, asthma, learning disability, ADHD, diabetes, and arthritis among children in the US have risen. It wasn't always like this. What's happening to the health of our nation? Could it have anything to do with exposing our children to more and more and more bacterial and live virus vaccines in the first five years of life? And then, of course, here's the alternative approach. Humans and infectious microbes have coexisted as long as we've walked the earth. The human immune system has developed an efficient way of meeting the challenge of viruses and bacteria. In other words, it's sort of more natural uh, to encounter bacteria and viruses uh, rather than to vaccinate against them. And perhaps these vaccines are causing all of these various conditions. So again, an ecologic observation that obviously has some people very troubled. And then here's a third one um, about, um, these are early studies by Bill Reeves, who was the chairman of the epidemiology department here for many years, the dean of the School of Public Health for many years, and probably the world's leading expert on what are called arboviruses. Uh, these are viruses transmitted through the bite of an insect, and in this case, a mosquito. Um, and so, here you can see, prior to the 1960, the population of the Central Valley of California experienced frequent epidemics of Western equine encephalitis and St. Louis encephalitis. So encephalitis is an inflammation of the brain tissue, frequently fatal, uh, frequently producing long-term permanent brain damage um, caused by these particular viruses. Human cases of these infections in Central California have been rare since 1968. There hasn't been a diagnosed case in the Central Valley region since 1979. So no cases in people, but these, the mosquitoes that transmit the virus to people also transmit the virus between birds and to other mammals, particularly horses, which is why it's called equine 
encephalitis. So, but surveillance of vector populations, in other words, mosquitoes, and viral activity in sentinel chicken flocks. So you have flocks of chicken in backyards, and you test them periodically to see which ones are getting infected with the viruses as a way of monitoring the viruses in the community. In the Central Valley in recent years, has indicated a resurgence of viral infection rates, uh, an increase in cases in horses. So in other words, the virus is still there. It's still in mosquitoes that are transmitting it to birds and to horses, but there aren't any human cases. Okay? And uh, so the rate of these cases in humans has gone down, despite the virus still being present. And this is at the same time that television ownership and air conditioning ownership are increasing in the Central Valley. So I don't know how many people we have here from the Central Valley, but um, uh, here you can see this hypothesis, if you will, this observation that the introduction and widespread use of air conditioning and television in the country has had a substantial effect on the lifestyle of the American populace. The most obvious element of this effect involves time spent in the enjoyment of these appliances and as a consequence, the probable increased time spent indoors. So anybody here from the Central Valley? Okay, so can you imagine, did you grow up in a house with air conditioning and television? Okay, so uh, if there hadn't been air conditioning and television, where do you suspect you might have spent much of your late afternoons and early evenings? I don't know, pretty hot. Pretty hot in the Central Valley in the summer. In the shade. Okay, but quite possibly outside where there's a breeze, in the shade perhaps. But the implication here is that once people had television sets and air conditioning, instead of sitting outside late afternoon and evening, they would of course sit inside in an air conditioned room watching television and thereby potentially reducing their exposure to the mosquitoes to transmit these viruses. So if you will, an ecologic observation. Okay, so just several examples of what I call ecologic observations. Here you can see cases of human cases uh, of this uh, disease, very severe encephalitis cases, basically disappearing. Um, at the same time, this is percentage of households with television sets in the Central Valley between, nine, believe it or not, a long time ago people didn't have televisions. So back in 1952, very few households had televisions. And then obviously a very rapid increase such that most households had TVs by the mid-1960s. And similarly, a rapid increase in the number of how proportion of households with air conditioning, either central air conditioning or room air conditioners. Okay? So observations. So ecologic studies are studies that attempt to see whether there is a statistically significant relationship between these uh, exposures and these outcomes at a population level, at the group level, not at the individual level. Okay? So as, as the dictionary defines the studies in which the units of analysis are populations or groups of people rather than individuals. And after today, all of the other studies we'll talk about are studies in which we study individuals. So are you a smoker? Yes or no. Do you get lung cancer? Yes or no. We study individuals. In ecologic studies, we study things at the group level. So let me illustrate what I mean by that. There are a number of types of ecologic studies. Many people ignore these differences, but I think it's worth pointing them out. So one type of ecologic study are referred to as multiple group studies. And these are studies that compare rates of the same disease in many regions during the same time period. And one example of that would be these migrant studies we talked about the week before last. So how do the rates of disease in different areas compare? Okay, and I'll show you some examples of that. And then not only how do they compare, but then you can analyze that in these analytic studies and look at whether there's a statistically significant association between some average exposure level or prevalence of the, uh, or proportion of the groups and the rate of disease in unexposed or exposed groups. So what does all that mean? Uh, here's a simple example of an ecologic study of that type. So on the y-axis is the incidence of hip fractures per 100,000 people. On the x-axis is the per capita calcium consumption in milligrams per day. And then on this graph are not individuals, but entire countries. Okay, so here you can see, for example, that Hong Kong, in Hong Kong, the per capita calcium consumption, milligrams per day, is very low. 
and the incidence of hip fractures is very low. In the United States, the per capita consumption of calcium is quite high, and the incidence of hip fractures is quite high. And if you wanted to draw a line through these points, you could. If you wanted to calculate a correlation coefficient, you could. And you would find that there's a statistically significant relationship showing that at the population level, increasing calcium consumption is associated with an increasing risk of hip fracture. Okay. Now, does that prove that at the individual level, the more calcium you take in, the more likely you are to have a hip fracture? We'd like to hope it's sort of the opposite, actually. Um, and a lot of our recommendations to women to take a lot of calcium are based on the fact that we think it is the opposite. But at the popular, yeah. Why is this the case? Why is this the case? Yeah. So, it, I think you can imagine that if you took, if you took a lot of other illnesses here, you would find a very similar relationship if you took a lot of different exposures here. So for example, uh, if you took down here numbers of hours per week spent watching television, you might find a very similar relationship. Okay? Well, that's exactly the question. Does this indicate a causal relationship between, these, between this exposure and this outcome at the individual level? Can you take ecologic group level data and infer anything about what's happening at the individual level. And unfortunately, the answer is typically no, you cannot. That's why some people consider these studies hypothesis generating rather than hypothesis testing. Okay? But I will show you examples where the observation is that there's a very strong ecologic relationship between an exposure and an outcome that matches what we see at the individual level. Okay. So this would be a very common type, and you can imagine it's pretty easy to get data on the per capita calcium consumption. So somebody figures out how much calcium is consumed somehow. I have no idea how you do that across the whole population. Uh, and, and, and coming up with the incidence of an outcome per country is frequently fairly easy. So graphing or calculating on correlation coefficient is generally very easy and inexpensive. It's not difficult or expensive to collect the data. Here's another example. This is life expectancy at birth and GDP, gross domestic product and purchasing power parity. So here you can see countries ranked by life expectancy and their uh, GDP, in other words, an indicator of their economic uh, well-being, if you will. And you can see in this ranking, Japan has the highest life expectancy at birth. It doesn't have the highest GDP, uh, lower than Switzerland's. But if you were to graph these, you'd see a pretty clear relationship between these. And so here's a graph uh, of the GDP per head of household versus life expectancy in years. And again, on this graph are countries. So here you can see the US has the highest GDP per head. Um, and on this particular graph, uh, you can see Japan still has the highest life expectancy. But you can see a pretty clear relationship but it's not a linear relationship. It's a complex relationship that goes up very, very rapidly down here and then basically levels off. Okay? So uh, what does that tell us about the relationship between economics and, and longevity? There's a correlation at the population level. Okay? Does it say that within the United States, the richer you are, the longer your life expectancy? Maybe. Maybe not. You can't really tell from ecologic data, from ecologic studies. This is basically a similar study, except here it's the relationship between current mortality rates from asbestos-related diseases and historical asbestos consumption. So again, these are individual countries looking at, on average, how much asbestos a country used in the past and what the current rate of asbestos-related health outcomes are. So what are the things that asbestos gives you? Pardon? Mesothelioma, which is a terrible cancer of the uh, lining of the lung or of the intestine, the, uh, the abdomen, and also lung cancer, and also a disease called asbestosis, which is a very severe obstructive disease in the lungs. So you put all of those together and you say, is there at the population level a correlation between past use of asbestos uh, 
and rate of asbestos-related illness? The answer is, yes, there is. And in fact, this is an example where at the individual level, you would actually also see a strong relationship between exposure and the risk of these various outcomes. Okay? Okay, so those, that's one type of ecologic study. Another very common type of ecologic study are what are called time trend studies. Studies that examine the rate of a disease over time in one geographically defined population. Uh, this includes what we call age period cohort analyses. Um, so what you're basically interested in is, over time, how does the rate of a disease change in a population? And how does that relate to changes in exposure at the population level in that population? Okay? Um, and so, yeah. Pardon? Do these always go forward? No, you could go back in, in time and do these retrospectively as well. Okay? Um, so going back to the television and air conditioning and, and, and encephalitis, here you can see uh, from this study that they did longitudinal analysis of annual percentage TV ownership in individual counties or regions revealed a marked negative association between the growth of TV ownership and the decline in encephalitis rates. Okay? So in other words, basically, uh, the, the, as, as television ownership went up in a county, the proportion of people in a county with a TV went up, the rate of the disease went down in the same county, but over changing time periods. Okay? Um, and so, uh, and the, those counties experienced the greatest increase in TV ownership, had the greatest declines in encephalitis rates. So here's an example of the graph. Here's the decline in the rates. So this is the, 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 the decrease in the rate of encephalitis over time, and this is the increase in TV ownership, and drawing the best line they can here, basically showing a negative relationship. So in the same area, over different time periods, one of these, TV ownership, predicts the rate of this type of encephalitis, right? basically an ecologic observation suggesting that TV ownership and air conditioning actually uh, do change the increasing availability and use of those appliances change the risk of this disease. Okay? Here we're not comparing in areas, we're comparing time periods for the same uh, uh, area and seeing changes. This would be an, another example. So. These are basically what you might call before-after comparisons. These are very common. And so these are the rates of neural tube defects in different countries. So neural tube defects include anencephaly, being born without a brain, which is obviously incompatible with life, uh, or a very partial brain, incompatible with life, or spina bifida, uh, a leading cause of, of, uh, of uh, disability in children. Uh, because of an, a failure to close the lower part of the spinal cord, frequently resulting in uh, at least uh, inability to walk, uh, inability to use the lower limbs. Uh, and so many of you, I think we've already talked about this, that uh, elegant studies that we'll show a little bit of uh, in a, next week uh, showed that uh, uh, folic acid, a B vitamin, uh, decreases uh, the rate of neural tube defects if a woman is taking folic acid very or very early in her pregnancy before she knows she's pregnant. So fortify, giving women multivitamins once they know they're pregnant doesn't work to prevent this defect because the neural tube closes in the first eight to ten weeks of life before you know typically that you are pregnant. So as a result we fortified various flour, grains, pastas, cereals with folic acid. And then here are the rates of the prevalences of neural tube defects um, before and after fortification in the US, various parts of Canada, Chile, and basically showing that after fortification was in place, the rates of neural tube defects went down. The prevalence of neural tube defects went down, suggesting that this was a very useful public health intervention. Yes. Thank <laughs> you. 
So, so you're being recommended if you're of childbearing age and, and have two X chromosomes that you should take multivitamins on a daily basis and, and that that's good for you and potentially for your baby if you get pregnant and that's true. But attempts to, to that to reduce neurotube defects by recommending that women of reproductive age take a daily multivitamin were an utter failure. They don't work because the average woman uh, who's of reproductive age and not planning to get pregnant uh, generally doesn't remember to take a multivitamin uh, because she's fundamentally concentrating on other things. So that approach was attempted and didn't work, which is why folic acid was simply put into food as a fortification to take the, if you will, the, the, the necessity for you to remember to do it uh, away. Okay? So, and here are the data from Canada, a very elegant study done in Canada, again, basically showing uh, food was fortified with folic acid in Canada in 1998. And these are the different neural tube defects and basically showing a fairly steady prevalence per thousand births uh, before 1998 and then basically after 1998 a reduction in all of these neural tube defects. Okay? A before-after comparison which is basically a form of ecologic study. There are no data here about individual women uh, and how much folic acid they had in their diet, and whether their baby had a neural tube defect or not. Okay? This is an ecologic study. And this basically, in fact, then calculates rate ratios for the time period after fortification compared to pre-fortification. So they take the prevalence rates, pre-fortification, post uh, after fortification, they can calculate a rate ratio or a rate difference. And basically the rate ratio is about 0.54. In other words, the prevalence of neural tube defects went down almost 50%, right? So a highly successful uh, public health intervention uh, through fortification of food. Okay, um, now once we start talking about collecting data at the individual level, as we will uh, on Wednesday, um, you can imagine we could in theory do studies that both look at individual level factors as well as group level factors. And Jen Ahern will talk about these mixed uh, level and multi-level analyses in a couple of weeks. But, uh, and there are very sophisticated ways of uh, doing these and analyzing these studies now. But a good example would be the early work of Joseph Goldberger, uh, who was studying a disease called pellagra, a nutritional deficiency from another B vitamin, niacin, done about 100 years ago. And here, he was looking both at individual indicators and household or actually community level indicators and he found that the likelihood of getting pellagra was influenced in these villages both by low family income, okay, an individual level characteristic, what is your income, as well as a group or ecologic level variable, the availability of food supplies in the village. So in other words, However much money you have, if nutritionally adequate food is not available to buy, then you can imagine that also might influence your risk of nutritional deficiency. Okay? So Jen will talk, as I've said, in more detail about these mixed level studies, but, but they are increasingly judged to be very, very important, particularly in social epidemiology. So when we do ecologic studies, it's important to point out there are different types of measures that we can have. One type of measure is an aggregate measure, a measure that summarizes the characteristics of individuals within a group as the proportion of the group with a certain characteristic. So the rate of lung cancer, the rate of a health outcome is an aggregate measure, but so is the average amount of fat consumed per year in the population or the proportion of the population that smokes or the median income. These are all things that we can measure in individuals, right? We can measure any of these things about an individual, but we are now taking aggregate measures of the whole population, okay? And so here's an example. How many sociology majors in the room? Okay, so you know Emil Durkheim? You've read Durkheim? Okay, so here's some early work by one of the world's most eminent sociologists in France 150 years ago or so. Uh, and he was very interested in suicide. One of his most famous books is on suicide. Okay, and he noted a long time ago that suicide is not randomly distributed in the population. Okay, and here's one example. 
of his early studies that the proportion of the population in the provinces that's Protestant. So what proportion of the, of the population is Protestant versus Catholic? In those days, there weren't any Muslims in France, and there weren't too many Jews either. So you were basically either Catholic or Protestant. Okay? Uh, and you can see the suicide rate per million inhabitants. So the higher the proportion Protestant, the higher the rate of suicide. Okay? Now, does that imply that Protestants are more likely to commit suicide than Catholics? So is there, an, is, there an, is there a relationship at the individual level? This is a relationship at the ecologic level. Okay? And so here are some of the things Durkheim said. He was an interesting guy. Uh, if one casts a glance at the map of European suicide, it's at once clear that in purely Catholic countries like Spain, Portugal, and Italy, Suicide is very little developed. I guess that means it wasn't very common. While it's at its maximum in Protestant countries, Prussia, Saxony, Denmark. Nevertheless, this first comparison is too summary. In spite of undeniable similarities, the social environments of these different countries are not identical. The civilizations of Spain and Portugal are far below that of Germany. And this inferiority may conceivably be the reason for the lesser development of suicide, which we've just mentioned. And then, so he's basically saying it may not be religion, it may be something else that differs in these different societies. And then he goes on to say the proclivity of Protestantism for suicide must relate to the spirit of free inquiry that animates this religion. As a Jew, I have no idea what he's talking about. Um, I'll let you guys figure that out. Um, and here, here's another observation that he made about suicide. Here's the proportion of marriages in the provinces with both husband and wife literate and the suicide rate per million. And so provinces where both the man and, and, and woman in a marriage were, could read had higher rates of suicide. So how does one interpret that finding? I have no idea. I'm not a sociologist. Um, interesting, though. And here I particularly like this quote. We've seen that in all countries of the world, women commit suicide much less than men. They're also much less educated. Fundamentally traditionalist by nature, they govern their conduct by fixed beliefs and have no great intellectual needs. Don't ask me. I have no idea what it means. Okay? Trying to explain these data. So, so suicide, he's taking aggregate measures, such as what proportion of the population is a particular religion or what proportion of households are both, are the husband and wife both literate, and comparing that to the rate of a health outcome. Okay? Using an aggregate Aggregate measures, okay? Here's another example. This is, this is the rate of cardiovascular disease mortality on the y-axis, and this is percent of the population with an ELC, and an ELC is an earlobe crease. So when you go home tonight, you can look in the mirror and see if you have a crease. Uh, you may have to take your earring out uh, and see if you have a crease in your earlobe or not. But here you can see that with increasing percent of the population with a creased earlobe, a higher rate of cardiovascular disease mortality with a very, very strong correlation coefficient. So does that mean that those of you with an earlobe crease are at greater risk of cardiovascular disease mortality? Maybe. But you'd have to study at the individual level. This is an ecologic association. Okay? So you'll all go home and check your earlobe crease later today. Okay. Here's another example of an aggregate Annual consumption of beer in liters per capita, that's pretty easy to calculate for a country, and the age-adjusted incidence of rectal cancer. And here you can see, again, a very strong relationship. So again, is there a relationship between how much beer you drink and your risk of colon cancer? It's an ecologic observation, right? And you can imagine putting air conditioning or all kinds of other things down here and potentially finding something very, very similar, okay? Uh, here's another example of an aggregate measure. This is percent of the male population circumcised and the prevalence of HIV infection. Okay? And in general, people have noted at the aggregate level that populations where the higher proportion of men are circumcised have lower prevalences of HIV infection. Okay? And in fact, this observation, together with individual level studies showing a relationship between male circumcision and HIV infection, led to, in fact, randomized control trials, randomizing men to circumcision or not, and demonstrating that male circumcision reduces the risk of HIV infection. Okay? But initially, this observation came from this ecologic type of study. 
Okay? Again, an aggregate measure. So you can see these are very, very common types of studies. You can do this also with, uh, here's an example. Uh, this has to do with uh, the relationship between not having a pap smear um, and the percentage of the residents uh, in an area uh, who are, who've been in the United States for less than five years. In other words, what proportion of people in your neighborhood have been in the U.S. for less than five years or, or come from outside the U.S.? And this, these are odds ratios, not odds. We'll come back to odds and odds ratios. But fundamentally showing that the type of that there's a relationship at the ecologic level between the type of community in which you live and if you're a woman, your likelihood of having a pap smear. Okay? So these are, there are many, many examples of this. We'll skip over this. Okay. Now, in addition to aggregate measures, ecologic studies sometimes look at what are called environmental measures. These are physical characteristics of the geographic location where the group lives. Individuals within the group may have different degrees of exposure that could theoretically be measured, but haven't been. So in theory, I could attach a monitor to you and measure how much air pollution you are exposed to, or how much sunlight you are exposed to. I could in theory do that, but you can imagine in practice, it's incredibly expensive and difficult to do that for large numbers of people. So instead of actually measuring your, your exposure to pollutants, I take the amount of air pollution in the area where you live, and I use that instead of measuring it at the individual level. Okay? So an environmental measure can also be put into an ecologic study. So here, for example, uh, if you might ask the question, air pollution has been linked to increased rate of mortality. This is a major political issue, and some of you may know that just a couple of weeks ago, President Obama uh, decided not uh, to tighten up the air pollution standard in the United States. A controversial issue because it probably relate, will relate to in higher mortality, uh, will re re result in higher mortality. But if you ask which pollutant is in fact related to the risk of mortality, this is a study that attempts to look at that. So how do I get information about individual level exposure to particulate matter and ozone and sulfur dioxide? It's really hard to imagine measuring your individual exposure to these things over a prolonged period of time and then seeing who lives and who dies. It's just sort of hard to imagine, right? So this is an ecologic study, takes daily mortality rates in large cities, 20 U.S. cities, and takes air pollution data collected by the EPA and does an ecologic assessment of the relationship between how much air pollution in the city you live in and the death rates in that city, okay? So this is an environmental measure, air pollution. And to cut to the chase here, fundamentally what they find is that, that the important air pollutant is particulate matter, not ozone. So at the, at the ecologic level, the amount of particulate matter in the air is associated with the all-cause death rate in a city, but the amount of ozone is not, okay? Whether you're willing to make policy based on that, we could, we could have an interesting discussion about. But it's an, it's an example of an ecologic study where what they're measuring is some, something in the environment as opposed to an aggregate measure across uh, the population. Okay, and here you can basically see after taking into account potential confounders, et cetera, consistent evidence, the level of particulate matter 10 is associated with the rate of death from all causes, from cardiovascular respiratory illness, the estimated increase in the relative rate of death from all causes, 0.5% for each increase in PM10 of 10 micrograms per cubic millimeter. Okay? So raising the question of should one lower the permissible amount of particulate matter in the air in order to try and reduce mortality. And of course, many people in public health think you should, uh, but that bumps into rather important issues around economics and what industries are affected. Now, the other type of measure you can put into an ecologic study is what's called a global measure. And global measures are characteristics of the group that you can't reduce to characteristics of the individual. So for example, what's the population density where you live? Or what type of political system is present? Or is there a law, yes or no, about something? I can't measure that at the individual level. It makes no sense, okay? But I can look at that at the group level and see if that has an influence on some health outcome I'm interested in. So there are also these global measures. And so here's an example. These are standardized tuberculosis. Uh, uh, these are TB incidence rates. 
up here. And this is the deprivation score of the community in which you live. So it's some way of basically saying, how impoverished is your neighborhood? How poor is the neighborhood in which you live? I have no idea how you calculate a, a, a Jarman underprivileged area score. Uh, it's apparently a combination of various census variables, a composite index of deprivation. And you can see that living in a more underprivileged area is associated with higher rates of tuberculosis. Okay? So this is a global measure of the community in which you live. And here's another one, sprawl. So could I measure your individual sprawl? Everyone knows what sprawl is, right? So it's the extent to which a community is spread out and not compact. You don't have an, I can't measure your sprawl. Okay, I can measure the sprawl of the community in which you live, right? And so this is looking, this is from a magazine, obviously not, uh, but, but here you can see less sprawl. New York City has less sprawl. Here you can see Hanover, Virginia has more sprawl, okay? These are counties, and this is what is over here on the y-axis. It's basically a measure of obesity, okay? It's weight, and it's basically how, what proportion of the population is overweight or obese. So at the ecologic level, communities with more sprawl have higher levels of obesity. And this has raised the question of whether the way we design our communities to either increase or decrease the ease of walking, getting from one place to another on foot or bicycle as opposed to in a car, might influence the likelihood of obesity. Okay? But sprawl is a global measure of a community. So that's also commonly looked at in ecologic studies. Okay, I'm going to skip that. Um, so, we can, people do these types of studies all the time. They look at things at the population level, various exposures, various outcomes, and they find relationships. And as a couple of you have already asked, well, what does that mean exactly, uh, to find a relationship at the ecologic level? And as I've already said, many people consider them hypothesis generating rather than hypothesis testing. But other people argue we're really interested in what the, the effect of something at the population or group level might be on individual health, right? We might really want to know whether something like sprawl influences your health, okay? So one of the, the key problem we have with ecologic studies is referred to as the ecologic fallacy. And the ecologic fallacy is the bias that can occur between an association observed between variables on an aggregate level that doesn't represent the association at an individual level, okay? So in other words, we see an association between beer consumption and colon cancer at the group level, but when we study it at the individual level, there is no such association, right? That's what we mean by the ecologic fallacy. And unfortunately, that is very easy to imagine and even to understand. So this is actually just an artificial example to show you how that might work taken from a textbook. It's basically a simple-minded uh, popu three populations here. In each population, there are two, four, six, seven people. Okay? So population A, inside the box, is the income of each of these seven people. The black, the darker black, represents somebody who's had a traffic injury. So in population A, you can see the mean income is $23,940 if you average these incomes. And four of the seven people have a traffic injury, or 57%. In this population, the mean income is lower, and the traffic injuries are less frequent. And population C has the lowest mean income and the lowest proportion of traffic injuries. So if you did, if you graphed these data, if you calculated a correlation coefficient, you would see a correlation that says that with increasing income, or increasing traffic injuries, right? But what this artificial example is meant to show is that if you then look at the individual level, in fact, the relationship is the opposite. So in fact, in this constructed example, the mean income for cases is $13,000, and the mean income for non-cases is $32,000. At the individual level, the relationship is the reverse of what is seen at the population level. So this is a make-believe example. These are artificially constructed data. But this can also happen with real data. That is, what we see in an ecologic study may not reflect what goes on at the individual level. 
Okay? And when you think about these ecologic studies, it's pretty easy to imagine that you can line up all kinds of things that have no biologically plausible relationship to the outcome they're looking at. Right? Yeah. Correlate, oh, define what? Well, typically the way these data are analyzed is to calculate something called a correlation coefficient. And the correlation coefficient basically, instead of just graphing these data, statistically tests the hypothesis that there's a relationship between the exposure and the outcome. And you end up, in the case of the earlobe crease, for example, let me take that, go back to that, because I know it's there. Um, you can see, you can graph the data, but you can also take the data and using a very simple statistical test, calculate this R, which is called the correlation coefficient. And the higher this correlation coefficient, the closer to 1, the, 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 the stronger the relationship between what's on the y-axis and what's on the x-axis. Okay? And so, and then you can calculate a p-value that goes with that as well. And these, this kind of makes sense for linear relationships. It makes you really, it doesn't really work so well for nonlinear relationships like GDP uh, and, and uh, life expectancy, where it's a nonlinear relationship. Is the association of the two causal? Um, well, no. So the question is if the relationship is causal, will there be a higher correlation coefficient? It's a really good question. The answer is no. You can have an equally high correlation coefficient and statistically significant relationship for a completely spurious uh, uh, association that has nothing to do with the true cause-effect relationship at the individual level. So no, I don't think you can infer anything about whether this is a true relationship at the individual level by simply looking at the strength of the correlation coefficient or the p-value. I'm sorry, if what? No, even if they are truly related at the individual level, the correlation coefficient could be very weak, it could be non-existent, or it could be very strong. There may be no, very little relationship between the two. I really don't think it's safe to extra try and extrapolate in one direction or the other, okay? And there are various reasons for that, okay? So coming back to this question of, of why do we do ecologic studies? Some people believe it's simply to generate a hypothesis about what happens at the individual level. What we really care about is do people who smoke have a higher rate of lung cancer, not is average cigarette consumption correlated with the average rate of disease, but are smokers at greater risk of the adverse health outcome than non-smokers, the individual level. If that's the case, you would consider these ecologic studies hypothesis generating. Other people say, no, we're really interested in these global measures, in these composite measures, and how they relate to health. And they may be biologically meaningful, so ecologic studies need to be interpreted carefully, but, but they may actually be telling us something useful. So uh, it's a complicated area. This is simply to say that sometimes we can look at, just as you're saying, is something we see at the ecologic level also seen at the individual level. Okay, and in fact, that's easy to do in a lot of settings. So this is simply to show that if you take something like smoking and lung cancer mortality, you see a very close relationship between the ecologic association between smoking and lung cancer and the individual level association from the kinds of studies we're going to start talking about on Wednesday. For bladder cancer and smoking in France, you see virtually, you see a, a, a you, you, you do not see a good correlation between what's seen at the ecologic level and at the individual level. So in the case of bladder cancer, the relative risk that you see at the ecologic association is much stronger than when you study it at the individual level. In other words, to a large extent, this is probably due to the ecologic fallacy. But in this case, it gets it pretty much right. Okay? So, Unfortunately, if you just take an ecologic study, we don't know whether it's in fact reflecting what's going on at the individual level or not. These are, these are examples where people have actually done both and then compare the results. And um, so this is, just, well, this is just looking at the dose response between cigarette smoking and risk of lung cancer. Uh, and these are the 
uh, ecologic associations. And as I'll show you when we talk about individual level studies of smoking and lung cancer, they match very, very well with the individual level data. Okay? So, but that is not always the case. So just to, uh, I'm going to skip over this. Jen Ahern is going to talk about these multi-level analyses um, uh, in more detail, so I'm going to let her deal with that. Uh, but these are studies that basically, again, take group level variables and individual level variables and analyze them in very complicated statistical models to see which group level variables are important, which individual level variables are important in the risk of disease. But uh, Jen is an expert on this, and I'm not, so and she's going to spend an entire hour on this. Um, and so I th I'm going to skip over that. So what I want to finish with is what do we make of these ecologic studies? That is, what, what's a reasonable interpretation when you see them? And I'm just going to show you that within the community of epidemiologists, there's not a uniform view. I'm just going to show you several views, and you'll form your own view uh, if you become an epidemiologist or not. So here you can see we believe the investigator is never justified in interpreting the results of ecologic analyses in terms of the individuals who give rise to the data. With respect to inferences about individuals, the proper role of ecologic analyses is to generate new hypotheses which must then be tested using more appropriate experimental or observational methods. So this is one extreme view. You can never infer anything about what's going on at the individual level from an ecologic study. Okay? That's one extreme view. Okay? Here is another view. Several practical advantages make ecologic studies especially appealing for undertaking various types of epidemiologic research. Despite these advantages, ecologic analysis poses major problems in interpretation, especially when making biological inferences. So Professor Morgenstern is basically saying, yeah, they're interesting, they're important, but be careful. Okay? And that's sort of a middle of the, of the road perspective on what you can do with ecologic studies. Mervyn Susser, a very distinguished epidemiologist at Columbia, equipped with an understanding of the dimensions involved at ecologic and individual levels and of the relationships between them, one is in a position to exploit the public health potential of the ecologic approach. In other words, these are very valuable studies if you are careful in how you analyze them and interpret them. Okay? So you can see quite a wide range of views about what to make of these types of studies. There is no single correct view about this. But ecologic studies are done very frequently because they're very easy. They can be done quickly and typically inexpensively. The analysis and presentation of the results are pretty simple and easy to understand. You can look at a very wide range of exposure levels that, as we'll talk about, when you study individuals, you may not be able to do in, an individual, in a study of individuals. So you can look at a wider range of exposure levels. And you can study these exposures, such as context and global variables, that you can't study in individual level studies. Those are the advantages. The disadvantages, as I've already said, are the results are difficult to interpret if you're interested in things at the individual level. And I didn't make much of this, but basically if it's not a completely linear relationship, as it frequently isn't, uh, these can be very complicated uh, relationships to, to disentangle. So ecologic studies, make of them what you will. Uh, obviously, different epidemiologists have different perspectives on, on how useful they are. Okay? So on Wednesday, we're going to start our discussion of studies where we study individuals, not groups, but individuals, and that's going to consume much of the rest of the semester. Okay?